I am the Cyber Security and Technology Department Chair at the College of Eastern Idaho. I have been in education teaching for about 15 years. Um, so when I first came into this institution, it was called ITEC at the time, but um, we didn't say cybersecurity back then, we said security. Um, so I've, I've got mixed feelings on that cyber word, you know, and I think a lot of us in this industry do that we've seen the I things and the other catchy phrases. Um, one of the big things that um, I have focused on over the last several years is teaching timeless skills rather than specific technologies, um, because we've got various um, half lives that you'll hear on the education um, students get out of these programs. They'll see, I've seen anywhere from 18 months to two years half-life on like a bachelor's program or something like that. So if you think about that, I go and get a four-year degree, two years of it is good. By the time I graduate, I might as well have a two-year associates, right? But that's not exactly true. That's not how that works. But, um, but the fundamental concepts that we can teach, those are really important. Um, Corey talked about that yesterday getting those processes, the principles, the fundamentals that are timeless. Um, so in education, the last couple of years, we've had this Idaho Cybersecurity Education Initiative. It's a mouthful. Um, so the ICEI group has been working for a couple of years. It was governor initiated through some uh, funding. We've worked with IRON to build effectively a cyber range. We've had um, all of the public institutions part of that. Does everybody here know what IRON is? Why don't you... Idaho Regional Optical Network, if you're not familiar with it. Um, it's a web 2.0 idea. Yeah, it's a really high speed interconnect between all the uh, cyber programs around the state. The state, yeah. yeah. Um, and so we have leveraged IRON with that. Um, Dr. Haney isn't here, but Dr. Haney with uh, University of Idaho did a lot of work out of Idaho Falls, coordinating people around the state. Um, and we've got legislators um, and the college presidents around the state trying to coordinate our efforts in this state. Um, I have never seen collaboration among the universities and the colleges like what I have seen in the last two years, which is actually very promising. Um, because if you look at the cyber problem right now, it's not just where are the vulnerabilities? What are the new issues? What are the new holes? We need more cyber talent, right? We need more people, boots on the ground, as it were. Um, and so this collaboration between the colleges and universities trying to fill the holes in the, in the various gaps that are out there is really important. Um, when I look at the estimates, and I've heard other estimates from um, Ed Vasco over at Boise State, but when we see these estimates on the job growth in cyber, we are, uh, the analogy I'd like to use is, uh, we're bailing water out of the boat, but the, the boat is filling up with water faster than we're bailing. So we are not going to hit the curve of the demand um, based on our current graduation rates. We're actually going to get further and further behind. Um, and that is troubling, but the collaboration that we've seen across the schools in the state is, is, is promising. Um, so remind your legislators to fund education. Um, I, I think one of the other things that I'd like to see, and I, I think ISU has a graduate certificate in cybersecurity uh, uh, post, post bachelorate. Um, and I think we need to do more things like that to fill this widening gap in cybersecurity uh, skill sets is we need to take people, sure, train new cybersecurity, but we need to take people who have the, 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 the aptitude for it, maybe other technology fields or even outside of the technology field. Um, uh, one of the best cybersecurity people I know had, has a degree in psychology of all things. Um, so we got to take and adapt. And I think many certificates. I don't know how you do that on associates level, but at the graduate level, you know, you do like a four or five credit certificate, something like that. Uh, but we do have to fill this gap and it's getting worse. Yeah. So um, to speak to the, the two-year level, um, I'm familiar with here because I've been working here for a long time, but um, we do have a retrain IT type uh, uh, fields 
where they can just take the meat and potatoes of the cyber program, the second year courses that are on intrusion detection, digital forensics, other things like that to fill in those holes that they may have and reskill. Um, but there are one year certificates, there are short term certificates or just individual classes. Um, here we have been working really hard with our workforce training um, group, who is more of a continuing education concept rather than um, academic and, and seeking a degree. And so um, in working with their group, we're able to collaborate on some of these various issues and actually do short term just in time type training rather than trying to put somebody on a degree path, they may already have it, so. Do you think the skills are just as marketable without the degree, without a four-year degree? So if you go get the get certificates and get some experience in it, are you are you as marketable in the workforce as I, someone who comes out with a four-year degree? I, I got a thought on this, and, and I think the answer is yes with a caveat. I think in order to get your foot in the door and get the job, you're gonna have a little more of a uphill battle than somebody who has a degree. But if you can demonstrate through some kind of portfolio, the projects you worked on, I tell my students one of the most important, and I guess I didn't mention, I know most of you heard me yesterday, I, I'm the director of cybersecurity for CRI, but up until this month, I was an instructor for cybersecurity at the College of Western Idaho for about three years. Um, and so what I told my students is, get the degree, build a portfolio. And uh, I had three students that, that they got permission from one of the student's employers to do a full pen test, websites, physical sites, everything. And they owned them. They owned them. They like went and bought these vests, like the construction vests. And they walked up to the front door at like eight o'clock at night. There's a bar next door with like a hundred people in it. And they stood there while a guy picked the lock. And he picked his way in through the front doors. Then there was the old keyboard with sticky notes on the bottom. They found some of those. They got into the network. They had a lockbox, and it was kind of like a capture the flag concept. And the, the director had put like a fake credit card in a, in a lockbox in her office. They got that. Um, and then on the external pin test of the website, they totally owned that. And, and those four students, uh, three of them stayed in cybersecurity. One of them I talked about yesterday went into DevOps and made six figures one, out, one year out of an associate's degree. The other three are all working in cybersecurity. And one of the things that really convinced them of their value was this portfolio with the report that was anonymized that they wrote as their capstone of doing an actual uh, penetration test. And so building this portfolio. So to answer your question, if you're building a portfolio, and, and it's substantial and you have example of doing pen tests, blue test, you know, even if they're self-educated, I think that will work, but you're gonna have a heck of a lot easier time if you have a two or four or a master's degree to convince them to just give you the interview. Well, I'd like to, to tangent just a bit on this. Uh, again, Mark Fitzgerald, Boise State University. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer, but I'm also the Executive Director of Customer Care. So my career has come from the help desk. And I want to challenge anyone who does hiring in the room to get better at your craft of hiring the right people. I fully endorse having a degree. I work in higher education. I can preach for an hour up here why you need the degree. But if we don't get better at hiring, we're going to miss the people that don't have the degree. And we're going to potentially hire people that have the degrees that still aren't very good. And I'll give you just a, a brief experience. My first uh, interview um, in the cybersecurity world, I was a help desk analyst and I went in and aced the interview having never worked in cybersecurity because I knew how to talk as a help desk agent on any topic. I had zero experience and they came back and told me, well, we can't afford you because you're overqualified. I'd never worked a day in security. They just didn't interview well because I could say the right things, but they didn't prove that I had the experience. And that's really where if we're teaching right, and I think the state it really is beginning to teach right cybersecurity, we're giving them the way to think. And if they can think, they can adapt and be hungry, as we were talking about yesterday, that thirst for knowledge to adapt going forward. And then we've got this wide variety throughout the state of two-year degrees, four years degrees, master's certificates, master's programs, in addition to the hands-on experience of cyber ranges, cyber domes, and, and uh, the different institutes that we're putting together. 
I, I do have one other comment. Uh, one of the things I tell my students is we are in the age of AI, right? Uh, most, if you're just sending a resume in and you don't know somebody that at the hiring location, there's going to be some machine learning algorithm that reviews your thing and it goes to the trash bin before a hiring manager ever sees it. And it's a huge problem. And I also think it contributes to age bias in IT hiring as well, but I won't go off on that tangent. Uh, but uh, uh, I tell them you need to get, it's a lot of work to get a good resume that's going to get human eyes on it. So you can do that, or you can start building your network. Join ISACA, join ISSA, join any cybersecurity group in your local area and start meeting people because those are going to be the people that hire you. I am, I'm not sure if I'm proud to say this, but every job I've ever gotten in my entire career for the last 25 years was through my network. I never once got a job off a resume that was sent in uh, to a, some kind of bulk application. Every single job I've ever gotten was through a contact. And so I tell my students that. And, and if I was like, if you're not in LinkedIn, you should be, because that is the Facebook for, for business and start making contacts. Now, if you just start blastogramming anybody in your area in cybersecurity and making friend requests, that's not really what I'm talking about networking, because that's you don't really know them and they won't go, oh yeah, I know Joe. He is, he is solid. Let's hire Joe. In fact, when I got my job at CWI, it was because I was friends with Mindy, uh, who teaches the network systems program at CWI, and there was a listing, and I called Mindy up, and it's like, you know, I'm a little burned out, you know, I think I want to teach for a while, and she was like, okay, let me walk your resume over to the, to the department chair, and, and, I, I, and I got the job. So, uh, yeah, that's what I tell my students, build your network, and don't rely on bulk submissions. If you if you're creating a resume and that same resume is going to 100 different employers, you're going to get 100 zilches. You've got to adapt every resume to the job you're applying for to get past the AI ML learning algorithm that is checking your resumes. Yeah, I could just echo that exactly. That's the same stuff we teach to our students. Um, a lot of our students are familiar with that process because they're right out of high school. And so they don't know you need to tailor it to every employer. You also need to, you, it's probably worth the hundred bucks to have a professional service help you with it. Amen. It's probably worth it. Um, and then build your LinkedIn network. I've, I've gotten into the habit whenever I go to a Zoom meeting or a whatever, I'll go and start hitting the people that are in that meeting with me because my face is fresh and they'll accept my LinkedIn requests. It's built my network really quick, but all of the jobs I've gotten since high school, they've been networking. They have not been because of any other reason other than the networking, so. Anything to add? No, you guys are preaching the right stuff. Okay, yeah, come on down to the river. All right, uh, let's open it up for more questions. Questions? Education in general, education in cybersecurity. Yes. You talked about having a cybersecurity project portfolio. Tell us about some projects. Yeah, excellent. Um, so, uh, do you mean me personally, or examples of students, or? Yeah, you, you personally. Okay. Um, I one little war story I like to tell uh, was back in the day. This is during the first dot com. Uh, there was. Uh, you know, it was kind of the Wild West. We talk about the internet being the Wild West. Oh, let me tell you, 1999 internet, that was the Wild West, as many of you probably know. And uh, we had a server, I was working for a tech startup and we were co-located at a, a very early co-location provider called Solution Pro that later got acquired and acquired and acquired again uh, over in Boise. And uh, the server got hacked. And I know I got a lot of technical people in the audience, so I'm gonna throw some technical lingo out for you. Um, and, and we knew something was wrong and I went in and started investigating and they had actually done a pretty thorough job of cleaning up after themselves. They cleaned the logs, they wiped the logs, uh, they had modified a lot of binaries so you couldn't see uh, who was online and who wasn't online, things like that. It always looked like it was just you online even though it, it would hide their logins. And uh, they missed one thing. Who here's a Linux guru? What file is not written until after you log off? Pop quiz. History. Bash history is the correct answer. Ding, ding, ding. Go 
good start. Uh, so the bash history is a history of all the commands you typed while you were logged in. And it doesn't get written to the file. So they cleared the bash history, but what they didn't know was when you log out, then it writes file. The only evidence was a bash history. And in that bash history, there was a command that I saw. So uh, most Linux people are familiar with secure copy. It's a way to securely move files across. There was a, a, something that predated that called remote copy, RCP. And they had RCP'd some files to a remote location somewhere out on the internet. And uh, so I was like, hmm, wonder if our copy dot dot slash asterisk, boom, pulled it all down. It was mostly encrypted. So they were encrypting their files. Uh, but as they updated the documents, they had to re-encrypt and they weren't. So there was some doc in this document was thousands of root compromised servers, including major national labs, government systems, uh, you name it, it was in there. And I was like, holy crap, this is big. So uh, I went to my boss and I was like, we got to call the FBI. This is, this is a pretty big deal. And so we reached out to the FBI. And at the time, the FBI isn't near as sophisticated with cybersecurity as they are now. There was like one office in Boston that, that handled this kind of thing. And so I sent over in, the, in those files was also the IRC chat channels that these guys were using to communicate. So the FBI set up a sting, got into the chat channels with the super secret passwords and, and pretended to be other bad guys and they had a big bust. So uh, uh, that's one thing that, that I like to talk about a little bit. Uh, uh, I'm also a member of Invergard. Anybody in here? Other no, I know you probably know InfraGuard, the FBI. Okay, so for those who don't know, InfraGuard is a collaborative uh, association between civilians and the FBI, uh, cybersecurity mostly. Well, yeah, all cybersecurity. And so you got to go undergo a background check, fingerprints, you know, the whole nine yards. And then once you do that, you're privy to information that the general public is not. So if there is a cyber actor or a particular industry that's under threat and being actively attacked, they'll relay that information through the InfraGuard website to their approved associates. Um, so if you work in cybersecurity in any manner uh, and touch on it and you're not a member of InfraGuard, I would encourage you to join. Uh, I know there's a, ch a chapter in Boise uh, where I am now living. Uh, as of a year ago in Oklahoma, there's a chapter in Oklahoma City as well. And uh, it's so InfraGuard, ISSA, and ISACA are kind of the three big security groups. Other questions? Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Other questions? What do you guys think? Do you think that uh, education uh, in general, uh, in some of the other programs, do we have are most of you guys like work IT faculty type of thing, or are there other instructors here? Okay, so mostly uh, you guys are grinding away, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what other topic? Suggestions from the field? Yeah, that, that was actually my first thought. What would you have at the top of the list as far as skills? If I can, as the panelists, yeah, ask the question. audience. You guys are hiring important? somebody. And you know, cybersecurity is a part of everything, right? So whether you're networking, you're programming, you know, cyber kind of touches on everything. What are you guys looking for if you're in a hiring manager position or even a coworker? What, what type of things are you looking for in the students as they graduate? Analytical thinking was the answer. I, I like that. Um, uh, I don't remember if I talked about this yesterday, but um, my background isn't in IT. I have uh, a degree in physics, uh, a, a master's physics, MBA, and a degree in environmental science. And so everything I know about security and IT and cybersecurity was self-taught. And I remember getting ready to leave my master's in basically nuclear science. And uh, one of my idols that I looked up to, Dr. Harmon at uh, Idaho State University in Pocatello, uh, who's now uh, retired, but uh, he walked up to me and he goes, you know what, that's because I was getting a little bit of flack because I was kind of going outside of the program and, and jumping over into IT for my first job. And he's like, you know what, Troy, that's okay. We taught you to think and we taught you to think creatively and to be curious. 
and that's going to serve you well. And I think that's what we got to do for our students going forward. Encourage that curiosity. Um, I, 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 uh, I believe uh, uh, there was a comment from a panel member before that that they hired somebody with a master's in cybersecurity and it was a disaster. You know, they ended up canning them. And, and I think the difference, and, and I've seen this too, uh, recently we've been interviewing faculty to replace us. And we interviewed several people with a master's in, in, in cybersecurity. And I'm here to tell you that not all graduates are created equal. So uh, once again, I think it goes to that curiosity. Are you willing to not just learn the material, but you're curious enough to go educate yourself beyond that scope? And, uh, and those are the ones, you know, when they say, oh, I got a home lab and I've been, you know, working on this or that, that that's usually a pretty good indicator, you know. That's a I'll add in a different perspective. I teach in the MBA program at Boise State, and uh, I t teach IT management. And it's it's a pretty vague course because we're not really teaching IT managers how to manage. We're more teaching general business practitioners the importance of IT. And so I spend a good deal of it on cybersecurity, but it's all about the risk. You know, what, what are things they need to be asking of their IT departments? What are the things that they need to be considering from a business perspective? And I think the challenge that I face is convincing our own leadership within higher education of the importance of the class and to take the same things within their college and within their university seriously. And so it, it's more than just getting the IT security. It is, are we teaching the skills across the board to assess and manage the IT process and all of the risk that comes with that? Excellent point. Other comments, questions? Well, you said analytical skills. I came out of that ICE meeting talking about curriculum just today. Um, and one of the prime things that was brought up in that meeting with the various educators present was that we have a um, secondary issue with math teachers in this area. Um, and it's pretty nasty because they're all getting paid the, the same rates. But when you think about the proximity to a national lab and what somebody with a master's in mathematics or physics or engineering or computer science or some of these other adjacent fields, what they can make going to a national lab, why would they stay in secondary education and teach kids math skills? And it's really unfortunate because we're, we're gonna pay a long run cost for not teaching that critical thinking and logic and, and whatnot. And so we're trying to figure out ways to get the state board more aligned with how important those mathematic basic reading, writing and arithmetic are at that secondary level, because it really affects the future of uh, those students and society in general. So it's a really important thing to put at the top of the list. I, I think compensation and education, I'm, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but uh, compensation and education is, is lagging. And you think you got it bad in Idaho, uh, down in Oklahoma, there was such a crisis that the governor passed a rule, uh, 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 executive order that employees like police officers and, and anybody in the public service could teach a class because there is such a shortage of teachers in Oklahoma that they couldn't even have class. So they were like, okay, Sergeant so-and-so, you now get to go teach, I don't know, history or whatever. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's a crisis everywhere. But uh, I, you, I think you got a great point about the National Lab poaching the good talent. Go ahead. Just to change the tax a little bit, uh, a recurring theme in a lot of the classes has been risk assessment. Do, you, do any of you guys have a, a book recommendation to, to read up on uh, or to polish up our skills on, on risk assessment, on cyber risk assessment? Um, for risk assessment, you can actually look, there's some really good material in the certification study guides. So uh, uh, CISP, CASP, uh, Security Plus, to some extent, uh, lists all, all the key points. And a risk-based approach to security, and, and a risk-based approach to most things is really good because if you're if you have a hundred thousand dollar asset and you spend a million dollars trying to protect it, that doesn't pencil. That doesn't make any sense. But if we have a mission critical asset like our website that generates ninety percent of our income, then yes, it might make sense to spend like a million dollars on an asset that's making us a hundred million dollars a year. 
So analyzing uh, from a risk-based approach and what the threats are to those and how you can mitigate those threats and then coming up with an actual dollar value that you assign to the what's called residual risk that's left over after you address your inherent risk. Um, and so I, I can't think of a like a book table book, but most of the study guides like CASP and CISSP uh, cover risk-based approach security and how to calculate risk and, and calculate uh, threats and come up with that dollar, come up with that dollar amount. And by the way, my company has software that does that. So. <laughs> and, and if you're having trouble sleeping at night, just read the regs on, on NIST 800-30, which is uh, risk assessment. Yeah, touche. I, I think there was another hand too. Was there another hand? Could you repeat the question for me? Uh, the question was, what are some of the skills we think, uh, uh, is this specific to cybersecurity? Yeah, cybersecurity people or employees need specific skills. I'll jump in there. It, it, it really depends on your organization. So looking at Boise State, cybersecurity is distributed. It, it really is incumbent on each of the silos to participate within cybersecurity in conjunction with the cybersecurity team. And so the people skills are very, very necessary amongst the cybersecurity team because they have to control, they have to persuade, they have to communicate. And those soft skills are much harder to teach and require practice. They require reflecting back and saying, how can I improve on this skill? Um, and with those, the technical skills really fall into place because you can then teach, you can then communicate what you're trying to accomplish technically to the other technical silos using their language. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, I introduced ethics into my first few classes of our cybersecurity program. Uh, CWI has an accelerated program and it goes year round and it's done in 18 months instead of 24. And uh, the first two classes I took uh, one night a week and I'd start talking about ethics and going hand in hand with that, I'd talk about soft skills, just like what you were saying. And, and I think we all know that that techie guy or girl that uh, is like super smart, but like, like rubs you the wrong way, right? And I was like, you have, if you have soft skills, you're gonna have a lot more easy time getting along with coworkers, getting along with your manager. I, I think gone are the days where you were the rock star guru, and but you were an a hole, you know, and and you would go in there and you're like, I'm the and and I think those days are gone. I, I think uh, you, everybody needs some soft people skills, and so I tell my students, you know, to to think about that, and and we talk about that, and ethics uh, is kind of the the launch board that I use to kind of start talking about soft skills and people skills. So I, I totally concur with you 100%. Yeah, me, I do as well. Um, that's one of the hardest things to teach. Um, it takes effort and work. Um, but just to really uh, epitomize that idea, we we had a previous name for our program, the, uh, the one that we had run for a long time, the computer networking technology. Um, but we actually changed that name to be IT services because it's a service industry. You are customer facing in that role. Um, the days of Nick Burns, the IT guy are gone. That doesn't <laughs> exist anymore. Um, so, but one of the other, uh, one of the other big things that I, I think is really important is we teach foundational principles. Um, one of the first exercises I got in one of my first IT jobs doing internet support was to go and look up the OSI model and understand the OSI model. Um, that model is not perfect by any means. We, we all know that modern technology deviates from it regularly, um, but if I have that model in place mentally, I can troubleshoot problems. I can do other things and they're kind of timeless in that sense. The OSI model is you know almost 40 years old um, and yet, 
it still has practical application today to modern technologies. There are certain timeless uh, concepts, knowledge and skill sets that students can develop that they have longevity to them. Um, I think those are really important to whittle out and figure out what they are, because um, I don't think we know them all yet. I think there are some more timeless skills out there that we are developing as we move forward. AI comes to mind. You know, what is happening with my echo chambers I'm creating with AI um, and other things of that nature. So our, our help desk manager talked uh, yesterday, and I think he has another presentation today. He talked about the current generation of student employees knowing more than any other generation and knowing less than any other generation all at the same time because they don't know how to troubleshoot. If you take away Google, you take away YouTube, their ability to assess the situation, they don't have the foundation of where to begin. But yet, if they have those tools, they're highly competent and very smart and, and pretty quick. If we can combine those by giving a good foundation of the principles on how to troubleshoot in combination with the tools on how to troubleshoot, you become a very valuable employee. And so learning the skills of troubleshooting but more importantly, backing up and saying, why do I do certain things? You know, I might know how to use our SIEM. I might know how to use our intrusion detection system, but why is it acting the way it is? What, what, is, it, what is its foundations? If you learn those foundations, learning the next big thing becomes that much easier and that much more skilled set. Plus, it enables you to talk in the language of those that were in the trenches before you. Right. So if they grew up, so to speak, configuring a, a network stack on Windows NT, they speak very differently than if they've always been in, in a DHCP environment. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point. And when I taught my students, one of the things I always did is talked about the troubleshooting process. And, and I would tell them, change one variable at a time. Yeah. They, you'd see the students and they'd go kind of like this. And they're like, it worked. I'm like, okay, what fixed it? Oh, I don't know. So uh, troubleshooting skills and uh, uh, are absolutely critical in almost any field, you know, technology-wise. Okay, I got this question. Okay. So obviously we are not doing things for them. Those are people that we need to do things for to get a job. So what can colleges, universities, and even Idaho State do better? The program's already growing. Yeah. We've seen yeah. it grow. Yeah. At ISU, we've seen it grow. Boise State, we've seen it grow, grow CEI. And I think they're growing as fast as we can with the, with the number of instructors out there and space available. So how do we catch up to the maybe the 4,000 jobs yeah, yeah, 400,000 jobs. And I don't know if I mentioned this yesterday, there was a survey done of cybersecurity workers and 40% and of the cybersecurity workers said they were gonna quit the field in the next two years was the result of the survey. And this is across a couple thousand people. So this is pretty solid. So how do we fill that gap? And, and then people in the field are leaving. Um, and I think the answer is not only as educators, but we got to change the field. Why is the average stint of a CISO 18 months? You know, it, it's burnout, it's stress, it's hard. And I, I suspect CIOs are probably right up there too. Um, so I think we got to worry about work-life balance more in the field. I think we got to, you know, I think a lot of students go into cybersecurity because they think it's sexy, right? All the students come in and I, I want to hack. I want to, I want to hack. And, and that is such a small part of being a cybersecurity professional. Uh, and, and it's just one little silo in the career. Pen testers, red team pen testers, it's just, you, you have the blue team and you have project managers and you have analysts and uh, there's so much more to it than just pen testing. So uh, we make our students uh, kind of start at the ground zero and we teach them networking and we teach them programming and we teach them all the basics. And then the second year they get to start, finally start to sink their teeth into it. 
Um, one of the things I think we can do that I started to do was previously, it was very divided. First year, hardly ever talked about cybersecurity. Second year was all about cybersecurity. And I sprinkled it in. I wanted to keep them hooked a little bit. So I would like every day I'd come to class with some new breach because there's always like dozens of those every day, right? And, and so I try to keep it and tie in what they were learning to keep them thinking we are talking about cybersecurity here, even if we're not specific. So fix the field and uh, we got to keep the students hooked and interested is two points I'd make. I think we need the help of K-12. Um, and this is probably with any job, but certainly with IT. Um, as they talk about jobs, they talk about money but they don't talk about what the jobs truly are. And so the kids are left to try to differentiate all these different things without really knowing what to major in when they go to college or, or what to, to move on to, to a trade school. And I, I have my own children to look at and they all have the foundations to be excellent programmers. They, they are highly logical, they're mathematical and they're language based. And the way it was explained to them in, in high school, none of them even want to try. It's of no interest to them. And I don't know how to fix it, but I do know that it needs to be fixed because we're not getting enough people into the pipeline. So how do we ever fill it if there's just, we're not filling the seats because there's not interest. And that goes with uh, different genders within the STEM fields. It goes within the STEM fields altogether. How do we encourage more women into engineering, into IT? How do we encourage just general people that security is important and it's fun? And dual credit, dual right? Credit. Yeah, uh, focusing on getting them in high school where they're getting college credits while they're going to high school and, and studying. Uh, so getting them early, I guess. Well, and Mark mentioned, mentioned gender differences in the fields. Um, I'm doing a doctoral ed doctor at ISU, so I've been researching this a little bit because it's my, my area I'm interested in, um, but which field is the, has the biggest difference? It's, I, it's technology. Mm -hmm. And which had the most gender difference prior to technology? Engineering which isn't exactly STEM. surprising. But one of the things that I have found in my research, the way you mitigate that is through mentorship. Hmm. And so it's, it's a self-perpetuating problem at the same time um, without getting um, strong role models for female students in secondary, it's hard to grow more talent in order to address the problem even. Um, so it's got this compounding effect and I also think it's very important the way these technology fields, the STEM fields in general, are um, that science, technology, engineering, and math are presented in K-12. I'm not sure that it's uh, getting done justice. I really don't. Um, it's not about the money necessarily. Um, I think we need to do better with vision setting at that secondary level and building some real solid foundation uh, foundational motivating factors for these kids coming up. Um, the day-to-day -day grind is not what gets me to work every day. If it was the day-to-day -day grind, I'd be out at the INL. It's a vision that gets me here every day. Um, and I think that applies all the way down into secondary. They have to have some kind of a, value, a, a valuable goal in mind down the road that supersedes the day-to-day -day sitting in front of a computer programming or going out and checking the, the meter on the pump for the widget, you know. Um, it, it's got to be something bigger than that. It cannot be these small time, I'm going to make a little bit more money. That's not going to get somebody through the day to day. So. Um, I 
we teach them wrong? Are, are, are we not educated the right way? If that's the case, then, you know, with, uh, how do we change that? How do we change the paradigm and how do we understand? So the question was, because uh, I'm not sure he can hear you, was how do we change the paradigm? How do we shift things so that we can uh, really teach STEM better? Is that the gist of your question? Did I get that right? Yeah, sorry, I, I couldn't find the button. Oh, okay. <laughs> STEM teaching. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, because you know, it seems, it seems, uh, it seems to, uh, systemic, right? It, we have an issue interesting kids in STEM. And, and so that makes me wonder that at, at a basic educational level, we're not teaching it right. Um, and Josh kind of kind of touched on that. And I, I guess if I were going to form it into a question, uh, how do you change that foundational of a paradigm? How, how do we change the way we teach math? I, I think we're trying. So I, I got a specific example. Um, I have friends back in Oklahoma and friends in Boise who teach at the uh, uh, high school and junior high level, and, and they try to make it fun. So one of the projects they're doing is uh, weather balloons. So they like put on a little raspberry pie with cameras and sensors, and they fill up a balloon, and they send it up 100,000, 150,000 feet, and take a picture of the curvature of the earth, and they limit it outer space, and, and the kids love it. And the, the other one that I've seen done is robotics. So robotics is a very math and science oriented uh, field. And uh, so they have the kits. Uh, I recently, uh, does anybody here remember, I've seen battle bots, you know, where they take the combat robots and they find them. My, I, I always, I, I've watched that since what, the nineties when it was around the first time and now it's made a comeback. And so I went and I got a kit and I went and went down and got my, rear handed to me uh, by, a, by a tombstone clone battle bot that just destroyed me, hearts flying all over. It was disgusting. Anyway, um, and so one of the people in that group was uh, a, a secondary high school teacher, and he would do uh, robotics, combat robotics for the students and that kind of thing. So, so I think that's a, a couple of examples I can give of what we're doing right, and we got to do more of that. And uh, I, I would say right now, it's probably more the exception than the rule. I know that a lot of high schools and junior highs are kind of trying to key in on this concept, um, but uh, it goes back to, we gotta pay our educators better. I'm, I, I, I think it's a, a travesty what's, what's, you know, we're asking people to work for 30 and $40,000 a year when the, and that's below the median income of the state of Idaho. So, you know, uh, I think that's part of it too. Yes. Hello? <laughs> Hello. So I guess I kind of have more like, you're talking how to get kids interested in STEM, but how do we actually drill it down deeper to IT? Because we have, we put on the Tech Expo and we have an ITS program, but when you have a booth and kids, there's thousands of kids going by, how do you draw kids into IT? Because like, what do you set up? Put out a switch there? Uh, <laughs> a, a light flash? Oh, what? Uh, what's that do? Some drilling kids staring at the light. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So how do we treat the question? Uh, I guess you can use the mic, but um, I don't know. Do you guys have thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I do. Is is one thing is IT is perceived as programming. And the breadth and understanding of IT just covers so much from security to project management to, to help desk and client skills to backend databases to, you know, all over the place. And I don't think they're exposed to that, right? We, we're, we're exposed to it because we're in the trenches, but there's nothing on, on mainstream media that illustrates our jobs. It just happens, right? And so, it comes to being able to get our message out of what does it mean? What is desktop support? You know, because I don't think they necessarily, they can probably adapt to that. It's the guy who comes and fix your computer. Great. Well, what's database support? Because I don't know what a database is. You know, they, they've, databases have predated them. So therefore it's just an unknown. Um, and so it's, it's the chance to explain 
what IT is and all that it touches and that there's a place for you here. Because if you're creative and you want to create things, it's very different than if you want to organize things. You know, if, you, if you're really good at organizing, great, let's get you on project management. Let's get you in security, getting the right things in the right buckets, right? So what are your key skill sets? What, what drives and motivates you? You like touching things. Well, let's get you out as a field technician. What, what is, you know, let's get you pulling cable. Let's get you uh, working on audiovisual systems and show what some of those audiovisual systems can be. You know, if you want to build a touchscreen cave, what does that entail? Yeah, so like projects, I think even if you go to like maybe even robotics, uh, communications, especially like drones and things like that, you know, wireless is not that far from the RF communication that goes on with remote control, whatever, battle bots or whatever. So trying to figure out how to make it attractive, but you're, you're totally right. It's, it's like ignore the man behind the curtain, right? And the old Wizard of Oz. Uh, we're all the kind of the man behind the curtain that makes the world run, but we have a hard time showing kids that it's a very fulfilling career. And, and uh, I think technology projects could, could kind of bridge that gap. Great question. I'll repeat it. Uh, how do you deal with the negative view of IT? Because a lot of times our peers don't, or our people that we work with don't know what IT does until something goes wrong and then it's IT's fault. That's a great question. <laughs> uh, so her question was, how do we uh, kind of dispel some of the negatives around IT? And, and I got a funny story to share. I have a, a friend of mine who's, uh, he, he just took a job in Oregon as a CISO. And he uh, was a guest speaker to my class. He's been acted as a CISO a director for companies, everything from like Nike to governments. And, and he gets in the class and, and I introduce him and we worked together at HP like 20 years ago in, in cybersecurity. And, and, and he goes, he goes, well, the first thing I can tell you is don't go into cybersecurity. I was like, oh, dude, you're killing me here. Um, uh, but he had a point, and his point was it is a very stressful job, and it is a hard job. And if you don't thrive on it, you shouldn't do it. And that was his message. And I, and I kind of at the end, I appreciated that. I, I appreciated that. And after his talk, I had a student come up to me and say, uh, Troy, uh, I don't like pen testing. I don't really like some of the more technical stuff. And, and, and I was like, well, what, what are you good at? What are, well, I'm a very organized person. And my suggestion to her was go into project management and specialize in cybersecurity projects because you'll have a background in cybersecurity after going through the program. And any time you tack cybersecurity onto something, the, the wages go up. So uh, go into project management if you're a very detailed, focused, organized type of person. Um, and so his point kind of made me cringe at first, but I think there's a value there is that all of us are in IT. I would say a majority, maybe not all of us, but a majority of us are in IT because it was a love that we've had. I love computers. I had a Commodore 64 portable computer that was the size of a freaking back, you know, case that weighed 50 pounds. And I took it to my high school and I set it up and I had digitized music. And I remember all the other students in the, in the high school class looking at me like, what the hell are you going to do with digital, digitized music? If only I would have seen the MP3 player coming, man. I could have been retired by now. But uh, uh, I think we all got there because of a love of technology. And, and, and I think that goes hand in hand with the love of learning. I don't think you're going to have a love of technology if you're not a curious person and you want to say, how does that work? How do I do that? I want to do that. Um, and and uh, so that would be my take. So, oh, go for it, go for it. Um, no, I, I totally agree. Um, my parents like to tell stories of me, like taking apart things as a child and taking the toaster apart and putting it back together again and other things like that. But that, that love of learning is really intrinsic to these fields. Um, dispelling some of the myths about working with IT, I, I do have to claim ownership for some of that, that we are, partially responsible for that. That mentality we had back in the 90s and, and the aughts was not helpful. Um, 
However, how, how we work around uh, those issues that are of the past, I, I think it goes back to teaching the basic skills, the fundamentals, um, the soft skills are really important. Um, I try to, with my students at least, I, I try to remind them that if you are disagreeable when you walk in the door, that's probably not going to help you solve any problems. Um, and in the long run, it'll probably create more problems for you. Um, I actually sat on a hiring um, a couple of years ago um, for a position and the one of the candidates had this really insightful perspective. Um, when we were talking about it, I thought one of the worst things that we could have happen here would be some kind of a cyber breach. And this candidate indicated that's probably not the worst thing. Um, one of the worst things would, ha would be having your IT or your apps team get disconnected from the rest of the organization. That's probably one of the worst because then your mechanism for fixing the problems doesn't work anymore. Um, and that is a very tremendous issue that we do not want to develop in these industries. Um, I completely forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> I think, it, you know, some of the negative perceptions or something of, of IT, um, uh, you know, yeah. like, like the Uber geek, Mm -hmm. I, I, there's there's a, a lot of smart kids, the college football, you know, captain of the football team, smart kids that 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 just because there's this been this historic revenge of the nerds view of IT, that right. that uh, it doesn't have to be that way, nor should it. And in trying to get them all to dispel those myths. So I think it's a classic issue, though, of miscommunication as well. Uh, it, it, there's a lot of past history, but we're not speaking the same language as the organizations that we work for. And to put it in plain business speak, right, we're not speaking the language of business. And uh, we face that within higher ed or IT within higher ed all the time. If I'm not talking about pedagogy, if I'm not talking about student retention and how IT fits into those things, I'm not going to get my message across and therefore I'm going to be seen as speaking another language that they don't understand and it will drive negative stereotypes. And so I think it's incumbent on us as leaders to learn the language of our organization and communicate within there. And if, if we have to make the technical details less accurate, that's okay because they're dependent on us to take care of the technical details, but what's the important thing that we're trying to explain about the technical details? What business process is gonna have problems or what challenges do, that we need to understand so that we can apply the right technology to it? Yeah, you can have an entire career just being a translator of techie speak to executive speak. And, and, I, and I tell my students that too, it's like if you can explain complex things simply, you're going to be invaluable and be that liaison, the, the person. Uh, I, one of the problems we have in cybersecurity is the director. I had one CISO say, I'm the director of no, 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 no. And I was like, we need to be collaborative with business. We need to empower business. We need to understand their needs and try to do security at the speed of business. And uh, I think that's that's critical. Is that it? <laughs>